Arsenio, can you focus on this first? Gotcha. <laughs> Paris Athena, when you truly want something, you go out and get it. When you don't really care about something, you wait for it to come to you, and if it doesn't, then oh well. Another reason why you are the cause of your own pipeline problem. Hmm. I've had that up there for a while, and I've kind of... I feel that. Anywho. Just forewarning, you guys. Not a forewarning, but just a little background information. We had a dope episode that we shot that you're about to view right now that me and Arsenio are editing up. We had a dope guest that FaceTimed in, and we were so excited about the guest coming on and getting our camera set up and sound set up that I forgot to press the screen record button. I remembered it like maybe four and a half minutes in, so these first four minutes you're going to see uh, won't have the guest's face, but then it's going to kick right up. <laughs> you're about to tune in to the next episode of the Dope Dank and Dime podcast. Go grab a joint. Or... Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Dope Dank and Dime podcast. We are your hosts, jessepeak.com. Got my guy, Chef Todd, in the what building. Up, what, up, what up? And today we got a real unique episode. We've got a very special guest, and you can see him right there on the screen. Oh, <laughs> Michael Auerbach. You know, I didn't ask you. Is that how you pronounce it? Auerbach? Yep. Okay, cool. It got some German background on it? Honestly, it, it's the, I think the original name was Auerbuch. And when they came to uh, Ellis Island uh, from Eastern Europe, from Russia, uh, what is now Lithuania, uh, they, they changed it to the more German-sounding name, Auerbach. Gotcha. Um, Interesting. But, ich spreche ein bisschen Deutsch, but, you know, we'll leave that a little later. Let so me my wife, my wife's last name is Stender. <laughs> <laughs> my wife's last name is Stender, which, uh, which is what you put a Bible on, but it also means, like, erection. Um, oh, are you serious? Our, and Auerbach in German means little creek. So our name together is an erection in a little creek. Wow. <laughs> that's, a, that's a killer combo right there. I don't know if I would, <laughs> I don't know if I would tell everybody that. that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got it. We, we're going to keep that between us. Like, yeah, they couldn't pronounce it. So I, we just went with this. <laughs> <laughs> Let me give you guys a little bit of background information on Michael. Um, super cool dude, and I've done a little bit of research. Michael Auerbach is an entrepreneur, investor, business consultant, media producer, and private diplomat. Now, I'm going to have to ask you later on off camera about the private diplomat thing, because if you have diplomatic immunity, then me and you need to travel so I can like speed all over the place in somebody's Lamborghini, get pulled over, show them my diplomatic immunity badge, and just keep it moving. Um, Michael is also the founder of Subversive Capital, which is dedicated to investing in radical companies whose core missions subvert the status quo and require sophisticated government and regulatory strategies for success. He's also the general partner in Subversive Capital Ventures, chairman of the parent company. I'm going to say that one more time. Chairman of the parent company, chairman of Arrive Acquisitions Corp, and chairman of Subversive Acquisitions LP. He sits on the board of directors at Tilray. Now, this is funny. It is. We had, uh, there was some time last year where all of us were just kind of doing little things in the stock market. Yep. And what did you do? I invested in Tilray a few times, actually. Okay. Uh, me and K9 had talked about it. So we were investing in Aurora Cannabis and a few other uh, cannabis companies, but that was one of the ones that we had on our radar. Though. Okay, cool, cool, cool. See, I didn't do that. I got some Dodgecoin and then some Hertz and some other things, but I'm now I'm going to have to, you know, dive in and, and, and get some things going with that. Um, Tilray is actually the first NASDAQ listed global cannabis company, and Michael also holds several directorships with companies that Subversive invest in. Dope, dope. Now, Michael, you started your career back in the late 1990s running Panopticon, correct? Correct. Hold on. Funniest thing, right? <laughs> Toss that over here. <laughs> we, we brought shirts to put on, but we've been so busy <laughs> that we left our shirts. And she just she was like, hey, look what y'all are doing. So, uh, yeah, no shirts today. That's all right. We're still cute. Well, Fair. I guess we're handsome. We're handsome. Yeah, I was going to say. Um, so, Thank you. Michael also sits, so he presently sits on the board at Theodore C. Sorensen Center for International Peace and Justice, the Kids Board of NYU, Hassenfeld's Children's Hospital, Next for Autism, which produces Night of Too Many Stars. And if you guys don't know about Night of Too Many Stars, it is a telethon that goes on to help raise money for autism. So that's really, really, really cool. And the Sophie Gerson Healthy Youth Foundation. So Michael is uh, very diverse and has a lot of things going on. For real. How's your week been going, Mike? 
It's been good. Um, I've been working on, we're also launching a couple of uh, exchange traded funds in, uh, in December of this year. Um, one for cannabis and one for the metaverse. And really? So we've been we've been working on uh, on all of the background to be launching those in December. That's pretty That's dope. That's dope. That's yeah. pretty dope. I like that stuff. Um, you guys, we're gonna jump straight into what we do on the Dope Dank and Dime podcast, which is talk about these terpenes and our strain review. So, Michael, today we are going over Mariah by Santana, Tropicana Cookies. This is the strain that we're going into today. Now, have you tried this at all ever? I have. Um, I think it's one of it's one of my favorite brands. Uh, the parent company. Um, when we did the merger of the three companies, that was a brand that was started by one of the companies called Left Coast Ventures. Um, but Carlos Santana is, you know, a really unique musician. He's got a great following, and he has a really authentic relationship to the flower, um, and just loves that brand. And you know, he brings it along with him, and a lot of his. Um, his followers and people that love him uh, will smoke that brand. So um, I love it when you come across authentic brands like that. And, um, and Carlos has a deep connection to the name and the, the graphics and the packaging. And um, I'm excited that you chose that brand today. <laughs> That's pretty cool. I'm excited too. It says radiance on here. You want to crack, yeah, this, open? crack this open while you're cracking that open. Let me give you guys out there just a little bit of information about this strain. Now Tropicana cookies is a cross of a forum cut version of girl scout cookies and tangy created by breeders at Oni Seed Company. It exudes an earthy, sweet scent and tart fruit flavor with a hint of cream matched with high THC. Cultivated with arsenal, artisanal craft and traditional patience, <laughs> this Tropicana cookies flower brims with the natural qualities prized by spiritual seekers. Man, this is a next level yeah. uh, experience we yeah, about to get into. Hold on one second. Now, let's, let's jump straight to this. I got a little bit more to, to go over, but... I'm going to go into our terpenes. So you smelling. Oh, you can smell it immediately. Yeah, immediately. Caryophyllene, which we all have learned is our spicy element. Limonene, which is our citrus, which is my favorite terpene because it gets me excited and gets me going. And then humulene, that is our earthy scent and our earthy right. taste. It says here, humulene and limulene are going to come together to form the sour yet sweet citrus flavor that's going to stimulate you physically, mentally, and put you into a full chill mode. So I'm smelling like that's a lemon funny. rind on this. Yeah. That's I wish you were here too. right now. So, but, but you've already Go smelled ahead. this, but we, we love going through this and, and yep. kind of expounding on these, on these scents. I'm going to break this open here. You get a little, you get a little more of that skunky when you crack it yeah, open. When you crack it open. But you still get the lemonine up front though. Which now, is, Interested to me. You're, you're going to be preparing a dish. For sure. And you're going to take some of these terpene profiles and they're going to kick off in the dish. Yes, sir. So, so, so what's on the menu for today? So today what I decided to do with that, that sweet, sour uh, taste profile, I wanted to go um, a beef dish. So I did a short rib and then we're going to do a duck fat uh, potato confit with some perfect, braised perfect. kale. Perfect. Give me one second here. Okay. I lost you. There you are. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so you, okay. you're going to get um, a lot of the lemonine and the caryophyllene in the sauce. Okay. And then for dessert, we're going to have an apple tart um, crumble with ice cream. <laughs> what made you come up with that? I don't know. It was just, I was telling uh, Dez earlier, I was just like, I was just thinking of something else totally different. And then that just came to me. I was like, yeah, let's just do apple. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you, Michael. Um, I'm going to ask you a question later on. And he takes things from conversations random conversations and creates dishes. So a couple months ago, we're sitting around and I'm talking about some tater tots that I made <laughs> the night before. Um, tater tots with some sour cream and some cheese. We link up on Tuesday for an episode and he comes up with this poutine dish. And I'm like, where, what made you think about this? He was like, oh, you were talking about the potato tots and this has potatoes in it. And he just gets inspiration from all kinds of different places. So 
first thing I want you to do, since he does this, drop a random ingredient, and we're going to see what he comes up on the next couple weeks. Okay. Turmeric. Okay. Turmeric. Okay, cool, cool, cool. <laughs> now, question that's, for that's you. Easy, like that's easy. That's easy? Something else to <laughs> add with that. Okay, throw something else at him then. He's, he's saying that's, that's easy. Uh, an ingredient. Uh, or, or give me, give me a, an element of a dish, like maybe... Uh, go, go ahead. What's what's the next thing that comes to your brain? Um, uh, the next thing that comes to my brain, um, Jerusalem artichoke. Mm. Uh, okay, 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 okay. I, I I like that. I like that. Now, Subversive Capital is invested in a handful of cannabis brands. What factors led you guys to jump into this industry, and what excites you about the cannabis industry? Yeah, so I first invested in the in the space back in 2013. Um, I had read an article in The Economist um, about a private equity firm that was started in Seattle called Privateer Holdings, um, and I cold called them. Um, and so I read the article because I'm a, I'm a I'm a I'm not a private diplomat. I'm a commercial diplomat. I work for the former U.S. Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright. I do not have immunity. Um, <laughs> and so we we help companies navigate like regulatory and government relations strategies, and so. You know, I was reading The Economist to sort of catch up on what's going on in the world for the week. And there was a little article about these three, you know, Silicon Valley bank guys that were starting a private equity firm in cannabis. And I thought it was awesome. And so I cold called them and they said, oh, we're raising $7 million and it's been the hardest raise ever. We've, you know, we're 13 months in. We've only raised, you know, just under six. Um, and I said, oh, I'll give you the rest of the money. And uh, they said, oh, that's great. Like, who are you? And I was like, oh, right. it's me, da, da, da. Um, so they're like, well, we're going to be in New York in a couple of days. We'll bring the paperwork and we'll figure it all out. I said, great. I got off the phone, called my wife and I said, I know we only have, you know, a few thousand dollars in our savings account. I just promised somebody a million bucks. Um, <laughs> call all your friends. I'll call my friends and let's get this together. And that's how it started. Um, uh, wow. and so my wife and I, we put together a million bucks of friends and family. Um, and we became the largest investor in cannabis at the time, uh, in privateer. I took a board seat. Privateer spun companies out like Leafly and Tilray. Uh, I sat on the board of Tilray um, until it merged with Afria a couple of months ago. Um, and then from there, we grew Subversive Capital into you know a fund that's invested close to $100 million in companies that require that sort of government or regulatory support. So like gaming, real money gaming, metallurgy, transportation, the psychedelics industry, and of course, the cannabis industry. Um, and so after Tilray went public um, and we started to spin out the other assets, that's when I started making investments outside of Privateer into other cannabis platforms. And so we've invested in a bunch of brands. Uh, we did a couple of SPACs. One of the SPACs created the parent company, which I'm the chairman of. Right. Um, and then the other SPAC acquired Israel's largest cannabis company called Intercure, uh, which closed a couple of months ago. Um, and so we're, you know, it's been almost 10 years now um, having invested in cannabis and you know 10 years ago there was only like six states that were legal correct uh, correct you know i'm from i'm from california, washington right california wasn't wrecked yet um you know colorado had just started was just about to start the experiment with adult use uh, washington state was next so it was um it was a completely different time but i always feel like you know the next year like we'll be a, we'll be you know closer to the end of prohibition and it right. always feels like it's around the corner and then, you know, <laughs> something happens. So, you know, the we're almost there. Uh, Prohibition will end at some point, And that's really the sort of the, the event that we're all striving for. I'm, I'm to, crossing to my fingers that it's 18 to 24 months that all this goes away. I don't know if I'm, if I'm, that's I'm pretty sure it is, you know, in that time frame. Honestly, I think it's going to happen next year. What do, what do you think, Michael? So if you had asked me like six months ago, I would have told you that I thought that we'd get regulatory change in 12 to 24 months. Um, the fact that this government can't, you know, pass a debt ceiling raise and we can't we can't get anything over the line because it's such a polarized. I mean, it's not really polarized. We have like a, a death cult um, with the Republican Party and then there's the Democrats. Right. Um, and so the Democrats want to actually get stuff done and the Republicans don't. And so. You know, while this is completely bipartisan, the majority of the country supports legalization. The majority of lawmakers support legalization um, and, you know, regulation around this. Like, we can't get anything done in Washington, D.C. And so, 
So I'm concerned that, um, you know, with the midterms coming up and all of the above, I, I don't know if we're going to see regulatory change anytime soon, to be quite honest. Um, I think we probably see some incremental change next year that will be good for the market. Um, but I really want the big bill, right? Like I want the Schumer Wyden Booker bill or some version of that, um, where we've descheduled cannabis. Cannabis is legal. It is regulated like alcohol and tobacco. Right. Um, and that the majority of the market is run by communities that have been most harmed by prohibition. Like that's I can feel be. you on that one. I can definitely <laughs> feel you on that one. For sure. Now, early in your career, you were an executive producer for pseudo programs. What are some of the highlights of being an EP for Pseudo? Any, any highlights at all? Yeah, I mean, the, the, I guess there were a couple of highlights. I was very young. Uh, I was right out of college. Um, the internet, you know, the dot-com boom was it. This was the first internet television company out there. This was YouTube before there was YouTube. And we were producing content. Um, some of the highlights were, you know, Eminem, like the first, um, you know, uh, show. Was on, on, was on Pseudo? Was that Pseudo? Oh, wow. um, we were one of the producers of the movie American Psycho uh, and had like the first uh, <laughs> seriously, you know, yeah, it was like all of the cast that they came on pseudo. That was really cool. Uh, but I think the highlight highlight was we we uh, live streamed the Republican National Convention uh, during the election. Oh, wow. Both the RNC wow. and the DNC. But the, it was the first uh, we used 360 degree webcam in every state um, caucus um, and we live streamed the event. And it was like a multiplayer screen where you had, you know, 30 different cameras that you could click on at any given time. And that camera and that, you know, that interface was inducted into the Smithsonian Museum um, as a wow. real bellwether for how technology was changing. That was pretty cool. Hold on. You guys were using 360 cameras back then? Exactly. See, it was and the Be Here camera. And I've got a 360 wow. camera in there that we don't use because when I edit, it, you have to do some extra stuff and edit with that in post. Yeah. But we're going to start incorporating a 360 camera into here somehow. I don't we, know. We had all the tech, all the technology we have today in terms of like, you know, web technology and camera technology was available. We just didn't have broadband. Gotcha. Right. So, you know, I was in the Panopticon tried to like literally build YouTube before there was YouTube in 2005, back in 2000. And, you know, people still had dial up 14.4, 28.8. Right. Uh, people did not have broadband. Um, and so it was just too soon. And then I totally took a different track in life after 9-11. The internet just seemed completely pointless. Um, I wanted to do something more meaningful with my life. And so right. I went and did my master's in international relations at Columbia and um, sort of worked in national security, Middle East politics, worked at a couple think tanks. Um, that was sort of, you know, my focus. But I'm an entrepreneur at heart, so I went back to the entrepreneur thing. That's dope. Oh, okay. That's dope. So I'm sure you've traveled all over the world. Where is somewhere that you would say you had your favorite or best food experience? Food? Yes. Uh, Israel, hand down. Hands really? Down, Israel. Really? Yeah. Tel Aviv is one of like, the, I think it's like the culinary capital of the world. Um, you know, tell it. So Israel is sort of similar to other countries. Um, it's unique in the sense that people came from all over right. Europe, uh, the Middle East, um, North Africa, um, even East Asia to come to Israel back in 1947, 1968, 1973, and then Russia uh, in the 80s and 90s. Right. And so you've got these all of these cuisines uh, coming into a very, very small country and then even a smaller city um, that has just led to some really interesting culinary experiences right. um, that, you know, you've got North Africa and Eastern Europe, you know, all these cuisines together are just, um, it's quite an interesting palette. Mm -hmm. And then you've got, you know, the spice markets that, um, that are sort of traditional from Jerusalem and Damascus and Beirut. And so you've got even the surrounding countries um, that Israel's, you know, not friendly with, but, um, but they share a common theme with some of the with some of the underlying spices etc so the the food there is just absolutely incredible right so so do you feel like that area uh the food is more you know fused with all those cultures and it is accepted in that way or do you feel like the traditional uh food stuff there is kind of separated and then you have like a, a fusion scene yeah, there's definitely a fusion scene, which is very good. I mean, you can also get great sushi in Israel, like some of the best sushi I've ever had really? in Israel. Um, so there's, you know, the people like food there. So there's a, definitely like a, a culinary um, 
uh, you know, class that loves uh, that loves good food. Mm -hmm. Sort of the traditional food is most of the Arabic food. Right. Um, and so, you know, certain foods are actually quite political in Israel uh, because of the conflict uh, between the Yeah, Arabs and that's why I asked that question because yeah, yeah. I figured it was. And so, you know, hummus and falafel are not traditional Israeli Jewish foods. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, Jews know how to make really good falafel and, uh, and hummus. Um, <laughs> but I will Facts. say that, the, that, like, the best places, the, place where, the places where, um, uh, you know, uh, people go in Israel to get, like, the best hummus, the best falafel, is usually in the Arab neighborhoods or in the Druze neighborhoods. Right. And so it's in, it's in Yafo. Uh, which is primarily Arab neighborhood. Uh, it's in East Jerusalem or parts of Jerusalem, um, and so the, there's there's political tension uh, mm -hmm. between the Jewish um, uh, resident and the Arab resident in terms of food culture. Um, but there's something very like um, you know, a uh, food is a very good uh, way to you know bring people together right, to for talk sure, about for sure. difficult issues. I say there that all the time. A great episode. It was a great episode with um, um, Anthony Bourdain, uh, where he went to Israel and to Palestine um, and used food as a way to have a very difficult conversation around Israel-Palestine. Right. In fact, I thought it was probably one of the most nuanced um, conversations. Um, and I'm in politics and have been involved in Israeli-Palestinian politics before. Um, but that, that episode that centered on food and the conflict, I think it was one of the more powerful portraits of what's happening in the Middle East than anything else I've seen. So, so I got an idea. How about we get all the Democrats and the Republicans together? We do a dope dang and dine event because you can talk business over food. Right. We get everybody slightly elevated and we just push through all these uh, issues that aren't getting pushed through. Hey, can you set down. that up? Or? It would be hard. The Republicans aren't going to show up. But yeah, I would love that. <laughs> <laughs> the ones that do sneak in the building will just uh we'll get them super high and uh, off of yep. you know some uh monogram we'll do, use monogram for that one uh, that leads me to this other question now you're the chairman of the parent company who just hired a new ceo troy datcher i'm guessing you had some input on who was hired to take the helm of uh the parent company give me two or three characteristics or reasons behind why you felt Troy was a good fit to lead the parent company? So obviously Troy is one of the most talented and capable CEOs we have in the industry, just given his experience at Clorox and Procter and Gamble. And he is a consumer product um, expert uh, and has been, you know, he led global sales for Clorox. And so he knows brands um, and he knows CPG and he knows supply chain. And so in terms of his like professional experience, like, He's off the charts in terms of like he's qualified. Like, he is he is a very, if not the most qualified CEO in the cannabis industry. That said, what we were what we were looking for was um, obviously you know experience has to make sure the person is qualified to run the company. Um, but as a board, we were very um, focused on ensuring that the CEO of the parent company was a person of color, um, either a male or a female, and so. We were really focused on on hiring someone from the community that has been most harmed by prohibition. Um, you know, these cannabis platforms need to be run um, and need to benefit people of color. And so we wanted to really put that message where our money was and ensure that we hired somebody that, you know, um, came from the community most harmed. And Troy has talked about it. You know, uh, Troy comes from a very small town in Alabama um, and cannabis, you know, from a from a prohibition perspective, um, you know, negatively affected his upbringing and his family. Um, and I'll let him tell his own story. But, um, but that was important to us um, that, you know, we had a CEO that understood the importance of ending prohibition and that a legal regulated cannabis industry, professionalized cannabis industry was one of the things that, you know, is needed for that to happen. It can't just be an activist moment. Um, you know, professionalized industry needs to help it get over the line. Um, and there's nobody that looks like Troy that runs any of the top, you know, 10 cannabis companies that are publicly listed with big cash balances. Right. And that's got to change. And so we wanted to make sure it changed for us. That I felt that. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I literally felt, I that. felt that. That's, uh, you know, we don't 
see any of that and to actually hear you say that, that's just, I felt that. So that's super impressive. And that answers my other question I was going to ask later on, you know, or it kind of answers it. Um, why does the parent company believe in social equity? Yeah, I mean, so even even when I launched the SPAC, um, so when I raised the SPAC before I knew I was going to do an acquisition of Kaliba and uh, have a relationship with Rock Nation and Jay-Z, um, it was mandatory that whatever we ended up doing had a social equity component to it. So I either wanted to do, you know, 2% of, you know, net income uh, or net revenue going to uh, social equity. But what I really wanted was I didn't want to do like what everyone else is doing, which is, you know, expunging political campaigns, donating to charities, like these kinds of things. That doesn't like, do I much. I actually want, well, it does. To move important, the needle, right? really. So like we, we need people not to have records for cannabis use. Right. But even if I expunge all the records of all the kids in New York who were arrested when they were 15 years old at the playground for cannabis and 16 and 17 and 18, like even if I expunge those records, the fact that the police targeted young black men at those ages to get them in a record, like that event changed their entire life. Right. Absolutely. If I just expunge what happened when they were 15, it doesn't erase what the effect happened between of the age it. of 15 yeah. and 40. Right. And so we need something that actually provides real equity to those that have been harmed by the target when they were 15. And so like, it's important, obviously they shouldn't have a record, but what happened in their lives since then dramatically changed the trajectory of their life. And we need to rectify that. And the only way to do that is to give real equity um, right. and meaning like real ownership. And so, you know, cannabis, this industry could sort of, could sort of act as a pseudo you know, reparative um, work for those that have been most harmed. And it's our black and brown brothers and sisters in the United States that have been most harmed. And our, you know, brown brothers and sisters in the global South that, you know, have uh, been most affected by the war on drugs in places like Colombia and Mexico. Um, you know, and I look at the industry and it's a bunch of white guys. And that's not okay with me. <laughs> wow. You get cooler and cooler I know, by right? the minute. Um, it's just, you can just tell from your tone of voice looking at you, this is something that's really serious to and you. And he's passionate about it. Yeah, you're this. super passionate about this. And that's, that's really, really, really impressive. I've been a, an activist for racial justice my whole life. Uh, when I was in college, I was a, a part of a mobilization that was fighting for the inclusion of more professors of color. Um, and things like we're debating now critical race theory. My undergraduate degree is in critical theory. Okay. Uh, full stop, post colonial studies. I went on a 19 day hunger strike um, in college um, because I wanted, and the whole purpose of that was we needed to show white faces and white privilege to the administration. So they saw that, like, you know, the, it's the security guards and our black professors and our black students that are, you know, the, they're taking the brunt of you know sort of systemic racism in the academy and you know look at me like like i'm gonna put my body on the line for them um because i you know need to use my white privilege to be able to ensure that we're bringing people up uh so that like i'm hearing voices from black academics and black students and that just wasn't happening in the academy and it's still not happening right um but you know that's something that happened 25 years ago i've been a I've been an advocate for sort of racial and social justice my whole life. And when I got into cannabis, it was a big part of it. It was a big part of why I wanted to invest in cannabis um, was around the fact that this could be a reparative moment for people of color. And what bothered me, um, you know, and I've obviously privateer with three white guys from, you know, from the Bay Area, privileged, you know, right. Silicon Valley Bank, went to Yale Business School, et cetera. Right. Um, and there's nothing wrong with the fact that, you know, white people are in this industry. I'm obviously in this industry. It's that most of the people in this industry look at social equity as just, a, you know, it's something, it's a box that I need to tick. Right. And I really want to do something transformative here. Um, and there's not a lot of folks out there that are like, you know, on board with it. Um and sort of think I'm, you know, I over racialize things or I'm thinking, you know, that like, you know, it should be the best people and the people that have access to capital, you know, support this act or that act. You know, I don't support anything unless it's going to help people of color um, equitize this industry for themselves, period. Full stop. You are you're, you're really about that life. 
I mean, and yeah, really, <laughs> really, really got a ton of respect for you. <laughs> ton of respect for you. Um, now we already did the ingredient thing. Ooh, ooh, here's a good so, question. Let me let me get that one. <laughs> um, okay. Do you cook at all? I do. Um, What's I your favorite thing to cook? A lot. My favorite thing to cook. I like cooking fish. Okay. Um, I'm a pescatarian, so I don't eat I don't eat meat. Uh, my son eats meat. My wife used to eat meat, but she just stopped. So she's now a pescatarian as well, so it makes it easier. Um, recently, I've been making like tuna tartare. Mm-hmm. Um, tuna tartare is always good. Tuna. Yeah, so I've been liking that. Um, we make a good like a uh, fish dish. I eat like a salad every day that I like. It's a spinach salad with like a um, jalapeno tuna um, yeah. that I like. Um, okay. You know, we cook, my son's gluten-free, so we do a lot of, like, gluten-free stuff, like gluten-free bread, gluten-free pasta. Um, you know, we like soup. I like making onion soup. I bought one of these, uh, like, crock pots, uh, like pot pots. Uh, oh, yeah. They make soup. They make yeah, everything better. We, yeah, we make soup with it. Uh, it's a great thing to make soup with. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> it it you put all this. Um, and so I, we like soup. Soup, salad, fish. Yeah, we're pretty, we're, we like cooking. Okay. Now... Yeah. Indica or sativa? Both. I mean, it depends on it depends on where I'm at in life and <laughs> what I want to do and how I want to experience True. Uh, the evening or the day or the morning. I'm I'm leaning most of the time towards sativas. Me too. Ninety nine percent of the time, there's that one or two percent that I'll uh, you know play around with the indica, and it just my body hasn't got acclimated to it yet, the effects of it, and it just usually puts me out. So. That, that's my thing. Now, do you have a favorite strain right now? I don't. Um, you know, I, I don't. I don't have a favorite strain, but I do. I have some favorite things. That I Like, I love the Monogram products. I love this new number four that just came out. I think it's awesome. Um, there's a couple of other brands that I like that aren't a part of the current company, like uh, Pure Beauty, which we're an investor in. Um, I noticed that. Yeah. Know, okay. Yeah. I love, I love, I love her, you know, her strains and, and her, her stuff. I haven't really gotten into like the, um, the concentrates. Like I don't dab and I don't vape and but I like flower. Um, I like edibles. Um, so like Rose Delights makes a really good, um, uh, like culinary as a chef, you would love them. You should check them out. Rose Delights. They've got okay. like, they work with famous chefs and then create, um, sort of one off gummies every couple of weeks. Mm, okay, um, interesting. Like, I definitely try like that. Turkish delights, and so a bunch of uh, famous uh, culinary uh, voices have made um, stuff for them, and they use really cool ingredients like pears and yuzu and apple, and you know a special grape that they get in California only, and some really interesting stuff. Okay. Now you said edibles. You mentioned edibles. I've got to get. Well, I I didn't tell you everything that happened in Vegas this weekend, did I? No. Okay, so Michael, you get to hear this. Vegas, Vegas, Vegas. Uh, no, it's uh, we're going to talk about it now because Dez is right here. So we go out to Vegas for MJ BizCon, and I guess this will be our MJ BizCon recap. Me, Dez, AI, and we're just trying to connect. It's our first time going out there, connect with people, um, and just you know survey the MJ BizCon scene. And on Saturday night, or well, Friday night, we go to a dispensary just to shoot a couple content videos. I asked Dez, I said, hey, they have a drink right there. Uh, it's a... Uh, THC drink you want it no we go back to the hotel and I'm like hey why didn't you get uh anything I'm gonna go you know smoke because we're gonna go eat he was like oh well I want an edible well we were just at the dispensary so we had to go back to the dispensary he picks out a shot and he says yeah you know uh these edibles they don't do anything for me so I'm just gonna drink this and I'll be fine he took this shot drank it 30 minutes later I have to send you the video. It's hilarious. Dez is, we're at the uh, Palazzo in one of the restaurants and he is sitting at the bar and he just starts like moving back and forth like this. Are you okay? He's like, no, (laughs) I'm feeling all of it right now. And I'm like, you've said to me 10 different times, edibles do nothing to you. He was like, well, this one did something. (laughs) And we ate, had a good time and we walked. uh, He was like, "Uh, it's time to go. And I'm like, bro, it's early. It's like 10 o'clock. He's like, oh, it's time to go. I think it took Dez about 25 minutes to walk from the lobby to the elevator because he was moving like a like a snail. It was the most hilarious thing. And I had to babysit him for the next 48 hours. <laughs> like I almost got worried. I had to wake up, get him breakfast, coffee, uh, get him a cold shower. It was, it was a fun experience. But you're not doing any more edibles, Dez. Ever, <laughs> ever, ever. You want to hear 
I have a funny edible story. If uh, you want to hear. That that was going to be my next. There you go. I'm ready for this. Tell me about this. So, um, so without using names, uh, I was in. Uh, I was at. Uh, I was out in Washington State, and for a company that I that I do some work with, and they had done a, a CBD uh, uh, lozenge and a THC lozenge, and we were meeting with a major Fortune 50 company in CPG, like a major company. Okay. And they were interested in cannabis. This is about and to so, be hilarious. This is about to be great. <laughs> and so, you know, we really wanted to partner with them. We wanted money from them. It's like, a, a, you know, hundreds of billions of dollar company. Like This is like the company that everybody talks about. And so there are these two baskets, white and red. Red was THC, white was CBD. And they said, you know, you can take some for later if you want them. So everybody like took a handful of the, the, this. I had, you know, my jeans on. I took like two reds, two whites, put them in my pocket. And, uh, and I flew back. Uh, to New York, and they stayed uh, in uh, in Washington and Seattle for another night. And so the next day, I had a, I had to go right from the airport to my son's school parent teacher conference. And I'm on the phone, and I'm just like walking around the block on the phone, and I put my hand in my pocket, and I take out the red one, which is the THC one. I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna like suck on it for like you know literally like two minutes. And I'm gonna spit it out. So I suck on it for like two minutes, spit it out. You know, I like maybe suck maybe half of it. It's supposed to be five milligrams of THC. And so just like to chill out a little bit, I just got off flight. And then I go into the parent teacher conference <laughs> and I sit, I, sit down, I sit down with my wife. We're about to talk oh, to the teacher. And like, I literally went deaf. I couldn't hear the teacher. Okay. I had a big smile on my face. <laughs> I had no idea what the teacher was saying. I couldn't hear her. Like, I just literally couldn't hear her. I couldn't feel my body. I like, Afterwards, we're like in the stairwell, and I just started hysterically laughing. And my wife, like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, I don't know, I don't know. She's laughing, I couldn't stop laughing. And then uh, I told her I took this thing, and then like I got into a taxi. I slept for like 24 hours. Wow. So I wake up, I call the company, and I'm like, guys, what was that? And they're like, oh, well, those were really misdosed. Uh, we the chemist that like, got it all wrong. It was like a hundred milligrams of THC. Like so, I took like fifty milligrams of THC. I'm like, we have to call the company and tell them not to take it. The company that we're visiting us, this Fortune 50 company. Like we have to warn them. And they're like, no, we can't warn them. Like it's a problem. Like you know, they're gonna freak out. Like they probably didn't take it. I'm like, I don't think that's a good idea. Yeah. So anyway, fast forward like uh, two months, we ended up doing a deal with this company. And we're having like a, you know, a party drinking up and, and I was like, oh, what was the best part about the negotiation? And they're like, well, you know, we took those red things and we were stuck in Seattle for like three days. <laughs> we, all were like, yeah. <laughs> we, were, we were all in our hotel room. We couldn't get on the airplane. We had to get on our flights. <laughs> That's beyond yeah, hilarious. That's beyond. I'm hilarious. I'm still stuck on the, the parent teacher conference. Yeah, you know, that's, 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 too funny. Funny. that's too funny. Oh my goodness. And see, yeah. a, a lot of people ask us when they see our, our food coverage, our food footage, are the dishes infused? And we got to tell them no. And Chef Todd's specific on. Yeah, I'm just really specific on the food experience itself. I feel like when you're uh, elevated, your senses are elevated. So the food tastes better. You notice other things, other elements in the food versus like it just being infused. I just, yeah. I can't, I can't do the edible and being high for half a day yeah, or a day Dez was high for 24 hours 24 yeah, hours no, straight I've, I've never done that before either like i won't do it again like that was it was <laughs> not fun yeah it's, it's not, not fun. i want to you don't want to be high anymore it's like i want to smoke i want, I want my high to kind of just go away and if i want to recharge yeah. myself i'll take another pull right. that's that's okay. my thing 100%. now if you had to take a road trip i'm stealing your question okay if you had to take a road trip <laughs> four hour road trip Name some of the people that are on your playlist. Well, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. I mean, am I, am I by myself or am I with my son? You're by yourself. I'm by myself. You're, you're by yourself um, on the way there. You're with your son on the way back. So on the way there, I would definitely, you know, I use title. So I, first off, I would be using my title. I would like probably click on my daily mix, which like takes all of my music and then like create the a playlist of things that are like related to what I'm listening to. Um, and so, you know, it would be, it would definitely be Jay. It would be Dr. Dre, it'd be some Eminem, uh, be run DMC. So that would be like my hip hop. And then I would listen to some classical, like Jan Pearson, who I love as a pianist. Um, 
and then I listened to some jazz. I listened to some Miles and some Charlie Parker and um, Theolonius Monk. Um, I listened to a lot of like piano stuff. So I listened to a lot of piano jazz. Okay, and, um, interesting a playlist. Lot of classical music. Um, I don't listen to really any top forty. Um, I might listen to like you know MIA, who I love, uh, like uh, especially her first two albums. Like I play that stuff on repeat, uh, <laughs> especially while I'm driving. Um, and and then on the way back uh, with my son, we would primarily listen to like all of Eminem's work. Uh, he's obsessed with Eminem and knows like all the words because he likes how he can rap really quickly, and so he tries to do it. <laughs> he tries to do it as fast. I think the guy's using like one of those machines that speeds up his voice, but he's, he's good with he it. records it at regular um, speed and then mixes it at, at a higher speed. Exactly, <laughs> and he likes he likes also like the '80s hip hop. Um, there's this great movie called The Wackness. Um, that has this great soundtrack uh, with like you know Biggie and and uh, a lot of like the sort of the early '90s hip hop artist Tupac, um, and so we listen to that a lot. Your son uh, likes the wackness. No, he, he's not seen the movie. He's not allowed to. But okay, he loves the, soundtrack. the soundtrack. Okay, okay, okay. Because I'm gonna have to watch the movie, and now yeah, I'm gonna have to check out the soundtrack too, so I can. Uh, yeah, it's, about a, it's, about weed, it's about a weed dealer, like this white kid that's a weed dealer, like in the ni- early '90s, and uh, he listens to all this early '90s hip hop. So it's just a great soundtrack. <laughs> it's the movie's not that great, but the soundtrack's awesome. Okay, that's um, cool. You know, the first song is like "The What" by Biggie. My son has all of these like T-shirts, and like he's got Biggie and Tupac and Jay and Beastie Boys and Eminem, and so every time he like Pink Floyd, and every time he walks into class, the teacher asks him like, "Name a song," <laughs> and he can name like four or five songs. <laughs> um, but yeah, we have a pretty eclectic music taste to, that's in our say. family. Like we like jazz, we like hip hop, we like classical. Um, the only thing we don't really listen to is Pop 40. Okay. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, like, occasionally my son will, like, you know, put a Halsey song on or something like that. And he put on a BTS, like, the Korean band, and I was just like, I had to turn it <laughs> 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 I was like, I cannot listen. Yeah, I would have put um, my iPod. Dude. But we definitely, we listen, to a, we listen to a lot of music. Alabama Shakes, I've been listening to a lot of Alabama Shakes recently. Uh, really? I love, they broke up. They broke up a few years ago. Okay. Um. And I also like kind of like electronic music, like Boards of Canada, I love, and Sugar Rose, the Icelandic band. I even like Bjork. I mean, like, I like, I'm a, I have a very eclectic. Yeah, I was going to say, you got a very diverse uh, musical yeah. music palette. Yeah. yeah. Now, yeah, you said like, you, you like electrical music, like EDM stuff, right? Sometimes, yeah. Oh, okay. Because we were leaving Vegas on. Uh, oh, and it was the. It was the, the that was CDM the or something. Cannabis. Yes. Yeah. So they had this huge, uh, I didn't tell you about this, we were leaving and there was all these people walking through the hotel lobby, girls half naked, guys half naked in, what's that, the Borat costume, the the yeah, leotard green. thing, there were some guys walking around through there and it was this huge EDM festival that they had out in oh, Vegas that was God. going on, so it's, it's, it's pretty dope. I like the EDM stuff, it's, it just gets me going, I can clean the house with that, or kind of clean totally. the house, I don't know. <laughs> now... <laughs> Since you brought up Jay on your playlist, I wanted to ask you one question. Uh oh. No, good question. <laughs> um, how did the chief visionary officer come together and him being in that role? Yeah, I mean, so so Kaliba had a relationship with Jay in a joint venture where they created the brand monogram. And it, we were talking to Kaliba before they actually launched the brand monogram. And so in our consideration as a SPAC for putting these assets together, I saw a lot of value in both Jay, the brand he was creating, Monogram, and also the relationship with Rock Nation uh, and all of the other artists and athletes that they um, that they represent and support. Because um, Rock Nation really owns, you know, they're like one of the agencies that sort of owns culture. Right. And they've right. got so many of the people that, that you would want to have a conversation around cannabis with or would want those people to have conversations with their fans about cannabis, whether it's, it's a brand or supporting a brand like Monica. Right. right. And so it was important to me. And so before we signed up with Kaliva, you know, I had a meeting with Jay and, and Desiree, who's the CEO of Rock Nation. And I basically told him what I told you in the beginning, you know, what I was hoping to do um, with the company, um, that, you know, we were highly focused on social equity. Uh, which Jay is highly focused on social equity and providing equity to black and brown folks. I mean, you can see it with title. You can see it with how he represents his athletes and artists. Absolutely. Um, that, you know, he wants to make sure that people own their own stuff um, and aren't taken advantage of. And so I think it echoed with him that 
I was somebody that was authentic and meant it, um, that I wasn't just blowing smoke. Um, and so he was like, yeah, let's do it. Um, and I said, it doesn't work if you're just, you know, concentrating on the one brand, which is amazing. Like, I want you to come and be the visionary officer for the whole company, for everything that we're doing. Um, and he signed up. Um, and he was also like, you know, a lot of the reason why Troy is in that seat has to do with Jay. Um, you know, we're following his vision for what this company is going to be. And we're taking our time building it. And I know some of our shareholders are pissed because their stock's not trading well. <laughs> um, right. But every every stock is down. I mean, we're down more than others somewhat. Uh, but, you know, all the stocks are down. The cannabis industry has been smoked uh, in terms of public market. So that kind of sucks. At the same time, like, we've got a big cash balance sheet and we're executing. Like, we're, we're building the company we want um, on our timeline, not other people's timeline. See, and that's what's super important, um, I think. And I think the shareholders will be happy later on when you're doing something intentional. And me and Chef Todd talk about this all the time. Like every move that we make with the content that we create, just being around each other, we're moving very intentionally. Things happen the right way when they're supposed to happen. It might not be when we want it to happen, but, uh, you know, those after effects are just enormous when you're moving intentionally. So that's pretty dope. Um, we're about to get in the kitchen. Ladies and gentlemen, because Chef Todd is about to just whip up this amazing dish. Sure. Just so you guys know, all of these products that are here on the table came from Kaliva. We made some purchases. We've got a Golden State strand, Bad Apple, a couple strands from Bad Apple, a couple strands direct from uh, Kaliva. So we've got those, and we just wanted to do a full immersion of all those products under the parent company. We're not smoking everything today. Nine responsibly well, we got one guy here that'll probably smoke everything under under this roof but uh we're not going to do that we're going to get into this michael thank you <laughs> for coming here appreciate um, you. i appreciate you i'm glad that we connected and me and chef todd sure. we're going to take some advice from you we, we got some plans mm -hmm. all of us do okay. let's call all of our friends after this and uh raise a couple million dollars and uh <laughs> yeah, you have get it, it jumping. Yeah. mike i got your number <laughs> your friend number three that i'm gonna text actually i'm gonna text you first give me a call, <laughs> give me a call. and also keep me updated on the jerusalem artichoke i want to see what you've made gotcha. oh uh, as soon as he does it trust me i'll, I'll call you text you and, and let you know what comes up with this awesome all this, right this is a really fun conversation and i appreciate the invite hey right. we appreciate you coming on and like i said you Either we're coming to New York or you got to come to Atlanta so you can come be a part of this whole experience. You're, you're going to you're going to love it. You're going to sure. love it. I'm sure I would. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Have Thanks, Michael. I'll talk to you later. Talk soon. Ciao. Bye bye. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to the kitchen. <laughs> bye. <laughs> Okay, y'all, me and Dez, AI, we went to Vegas, MJ BizCon, connected with some really dope brands while we were out there. And one thing that we brought back was from Flour Mill. A lot of people use grinders and even us, we use grinders. This is a mill that actually, y'all saw the footage, but this mill, you put your cannabis in there and I'm gonna show you this a little later. But what I'm noticing immediately is the end product is a lot fluffier than when you put it in a grinder. The meal actually makes it ball up and it's just real fluffy. So I'm looking forward to, wow, this, I'm, I'm looking forward to punching this in, in this bouquet and these rolling papers. Man, you smell so much more stuff in here. After you put this in the meal, the, the skunkiness of that humulene, the earthiness, is there and then you get a little tart sensation on the front. Yeah, this is that Tropicana cookies from Mariah, Mariah by Santana. There we go.
Okay, y'all. <laughs> we running through this edit right now, and me and Chef Ty got super high before we sat down to eat the food. And I mean, I usually get high. Like, we got really, really, really high, so I'm just forewarning you. We're in and out of volume. <laughs> the conversation isn't flowing like it normally flows. We usually have a nice little tight structure we go through, and uh, this time it was off the meat racks. So, uh, yeah, you're making a whole lot of noise. Um, anyways, y'all will see. SlightlyElevated.com. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I've got this Tropicana cookies rolled up on these bouquet rolling papers where you taste all the flavor. I'm gonna do me a little, they call it a dry hit. I always love pre-pulling the cannabis before I light it up, getting those terpenes on my palate. Oh, shit. This is about to be fun because I can taste the citrus and on the back of my mouth, I'm tasting a skunky. That's that humulene that's kicking. Almost earthy-like. Man, you gotta do a dry hit, Chef Todd. Yeah, it's like you you get that smell, but the, the taste of it, like we were smelling before. All of yeah. the terpene okay. profiles. We, 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 about, we about to light up. Time. Oh, no one's taking my lighter either. I've had it for so long. Please don't steal me. I think this is the message. Thank you, Weed Feed. You must be Okay, so as I pull, I'm getting soft, subtle hints of citrus and sour. Just not too overbearing. It's, it's really subtle and that's kind of amazing because sometimes you get strange where everything is just really overpowering. Let me get the lighter back. Uh, ooh. Oh wow. You ever had rips, Des? The little candy rips? Oh, yeah. I just tasted a little bit of rips in my mouth. Wow, that's that sour that they're talking about. The limonene and the humulene pair together. Oh, y'all already lighting up. Mm. Ah! <laughs> I want the special lighter. <coughs> <laughs> Dude, that's a barbecue. You got it. Okay. I got to tell y'all one thing. We use the flour mill, and one thing that I really noticed instantaneously, you're tasting more of the terpenes because it's not ground down, it's actually milled up. The flour is real What's the word I'm looking for? Fluffy. It's a lot fluffier than when you put it in a grinder. <laughs> oh. Leave me alone. <laughs> they were about to, about to D-I-E. <laughs> but because it's so fluffy, you get more of the flavor and it's not ground down, if that makes any sense. Flour meal. This is a hit. I appreciate y'all. Met him at NJ BizCon, Alexis, and the CEO. Love y'all. Oh, if y'all like this shirt that me and Chef Todd are wearing, 
slightlyelevated.com. <laughs> oh, y'all think I'm bullshitting? No, for real. Slightlyelevated.com. That'll take you right to the website and you can get the shirt. <laughs> That's how we keep this podcast going. Slightlyelevated.com. So y'all take your tails there. Buy three shirts. One for you, one for your mama, and one for the dude. I ain't gonna say that. Just get one for you and one for your mama. I love Dad's commitment to this shot. Yeah, he, he, he yeah. Foot on <laughs> like contorted to the left and everything. He in there. Okay. You good? Hell no, she dying good. over there. I'm gonna say, we did. Ooh. Oh. Hello. All right, we gotta grab the food. Yeah, cause I'm stuck. Oh, here, give me that, give me that. Oh, shit. I'm gonna put oh, that one. I'm about to put this shit on. Let me just, let me do this shit. Yeah, I'm sorry. I forgot the, shit, the lighter at the house. Uh, nah, yeah. bro, can you play with the two three? You ain't ready to play with this shit. Damn, man, those fuck with the two three. Hey, little video. Yeah, I got it. You know, you got to get the cinematic, you know, I got a 13 Pro Max now. <laughs> <laughs> you stupid as hell. <laughs> hey, but them visuals about to go ham. I'm trying to tell you. So listen, you have a slow cooked Mandarin barbecue short rib. Now, now, what makes this, this, listen, this look like listen, a. let me tell you something. I cooked this for four hours. Okay. Legit. <laughs> These potatoes. Duck. Confit. Now, what makes it a duck confit? I use duck fat. And I that's what, that's what was in the um fridge? Yeah. So oh, wow. I those off. But these are, this is like layered. Yeah. It's like a scallop. Okay. So you did a scallop potato, rendered, or not rendered it, but you let it just sit in duck fat. Sit in duck fat. And then. Then I baked that off. <laughs> right? Low no, and slow. It's like a croissant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Listen, I ain't supposed to be cussing at all. My mom said don't cuss, but she it. <laughs> Hey, this is serious right here. So the kale is a, a braised sweet kale, which I did with, uh, with actual mandarin pieces. Really? So that's what the, the, the edge. Because the kale is super, super, super sweet. Like, that's a good. It is to balance out the, you know, the, the vinegary part of the sauce and the meat. Hold on. Let's go back to these potatoes, man. Where'd you where'd you think of this? What made you think of this? I ain't gonna lie to you. I don't know TikTok, <laughs> which I'm normally not on TikTok. <laughs> I just so happen to be on TikTok. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is dessert. Chef Todd, what did you do? So this is just some uh, sauteed apples with a deconstructed apple tart crumble. Hold on, but what did you saute the apples in? Before you saute the apples, what did you do to them? So, I just soaked them in some lemon juice. <laughs> but, you know, for, uh, what did you say, like two hours? Two hours? About two hours. The lemon, listen, you want a little snack at the house? Dice some, what kind of apples are those? Granny Smiths. Dice some Granny Smiths, slice them, soak them in some lemon juice for two hours. They taste like, uh, what did I say they taste like? Sweet and sour. <laughs> Sweet and sour. <laughs> Sweet and sour uh, candy. Right That's what it tastes like. Sweet and sour apple. <laughs> Y'all, it's been another episode of the Dope Nigga Nine podcast. You got any more? Yeah, I'm about to. I'm about to have seconds. We'll catch y'all on the next episode. This shit fire. <laughs> this shit fire. It is. <laughs> it is. Yeah.